All right. Good evening and welcome to Faith and Victory Church, our Wednesday night Bible study. And we're about to wrap up tonight our um, teaching on confession, praise the Lord. And um, so tonight will be maybe, it might even be a little bit shorter than normal or what, than what we've been, but we're going to go for it. Hallelujah and praise the Lord. All right. So we have been teaching on uh, the confession power of life and death being in the tongue. We're using, so we'll just say, um, confession at all this stuff out you can go back the past couple of weeks and pick that up from proverbs 18 and 21 okay we're uh, we're moving on that hey Val, praise the lord and so um a a to the men glory all right and we're gonna i'm gonna turn this down <laughs> because i don't need to hear me all right, and I, I love our service, so make sure y'all share this out on the internet. Glory to God. I think some, every once in a while somebody hits the wrong thing and puts the mad sign up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think somebody actually did it one time. They were mad. I don't know why, but hallelujah. You know, we'll just, we'll get beyond, beyond that, right? And so we talked about, we talked about what? Um, we talked about number one, how our words govern. Amen. And um, number two, we talked about um, getting the right info, you know, getting the right. We'll just do a little play on the movie in the right stuff. Amen. And then last week we we're talking about holding fast. Remember how we talked about that, that the word the word in the Greek for hold to hold fast um, it comes from to uh, cause a state to continue. In other words, a, a, a state of being to continue. So we we talked about that last week, and um, then uh, we were kind of getting on, and um, I think we kind of we may probably did uh, do this was. Um, Blessing and evil is our choice. Now you'd have to go back and listen to the teachings on all this for, to, to get that um, without us um, recovering every bit of that. Okay? And so we have you know, we, we start talking about that our words govern. They, they, have, they do, according to Proverbs 18, 21, the power of life and death is in the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. And then that we need to get the right information from the right place. Joshua 1, 8, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that's written therein. For then thou shalt not wait that prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. And we talked about, um, you know, that blessing and evil, or, you know, uh, is our choice. We found in Deuteronomy chapter 30, you know, see that I've set before thee, down in verse uh, 15, uh, this day the lot, uh, 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 no, 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 this, see I've set before thee this day life and good and death and evil, and God tells us if we'll follow his commandments, we'll walk in life and we'll walk in good, okay? And we, I, mean, I remember how we talked about how that is not a um, reward for walking in it. It is what the result or the outgrowth of walking with God. You're going to walk in good and you're going to walk in blessing. God doesn't reward you for obeying him in that sen so much in that sense of, okay, I'm, I'm a dog and we got blue. Now blue will do anything for a treat. Anything in the world. I mean, he now will get up. You could go over and open up his kennel so we can leave the house. And he knows when he gets in there, he's getting one of those liver treats. And so now, Maddie, you had to drag her in. Blue, he, he can be sleeping by the fire, whatever. You open that door, and he walks over and gets in because he wants that reward of that treat. He loves that treat, okay? Well, see, he's being rewarded for obeying, okay? And he only does it because he got trained to get the reward. Now, God tells us he set before us good and evil, blessing and cursing, that he will give us good when we obey and walk with him. It's not that uh, every time we obey, we get a treat. 
It is the obedience to walk in his word and to walk with him creates in us a relationship that produces good and blessing. Walking with God produces blessing. Okay? He's not giving you a treat just because you did it. Okay? That's not, that's not how it works with God. All right? And so this is a, um, this is a situation where, um, you know, you're going you're gonna to walk in the blessings of God. You're going to walk in obedience with God. But the good, and the, the, you know, because Deuteronomy tells us that good and evil are set before us. Okay? And then we talked about how we're to hold fast. I got these backwards in order. Holding fast. Um, we're to hold to confess our profession of our faith for he's faithful that promised. Okay. And, um, then when we hold fast, when we don't let go, when we don't relinquish, when we don't let up that when we take hold of, then, um, we are remain and come to that place of steadfastness. So let's look over in James real quick. James, get real spiritual son. I said the brother of the Lord. Okay. Okay. See, well, you know, uh, verse 5, James 1. If any lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith. Nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like the wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. For a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So we look over here in James chapter 1. Starting in verse 5, going down to about here, we went down to uh, 8, 5, 8. Now, the word unstable literally comes from a Greek word that I know this is kind of awkward. It kind of really comes out, uh, let, me, let me word it a little bit different, not steadfast. Literally unsteadfast, but I think it is, to articulate it in language, it makes a little more sense to say not steadfast. So the double-minded man is unstable in what? All his ways. Now remember, we're to ask in faith nothing wavering. What's, what do you mean waver? Um, where is that? Um, it might be Romans where Paul's writing and he says this, you know, God's not a wa wa uh, does not uh, waver between yes and no. He didn't use the word waver in the King James. Um, but with him it's always yes and, our am and, and, and amen. All the promises of God in Christ are yes and in him, amen. Now, the Weymouth translation, if y'all could find that, that would help me um, give the reference to this because I don't have it right in front of me because it's not in my notes. Um, but Weymouth says this, God is not a waverer between yes and no. The answer is and always is yes with him. And our amen acknowledges its truth to the glory of God in us. Okay? So God's not a waverer. Between yes and no. Between faith and unbelief. Okay? You can't be one minute, glory to God, I got the answer. Oh, my God, what am I going to do? See, that's not holding fast. Okay? And when you're doing that, you're not holding fast. You're wavering. And the Bible says, let not, let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. Why? Because you're not holding fast. You're unstable. You're not steadfast. You're not bearing up under. Now, we use terminologies in the church, and a lot of times they get into religious circles, and they mean different things than what the Bible really meant by saying certain things. You know, uh, when we are bearing up under something, we're just, most people run around, oh, I don't know why the Lord put this on me. He put this, he put this weight on me. I got to bear up. Yes. 2 Corinthians one twenty. Okay. That, that's, that sounds about right. Uh, Yes, 2 Corinthians 120, for the promises of God in him are yea, and him, amen, um, to the glory of God by us, okay? Um, like back up here, it says, um, 
uh, but as God is true, our word towards you is true. The Son of God was preached unto you by me and to Sabinius and Titus, and it was, was not, here we go, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God in us. And so we, we did, when you read this out of um, Weymouth, verse 18, he goes, for God is not a waverer between yes and no. So who's our example? God's our example. We don't, he doesn't waver between saying, yeah, oh, no, nah, yeah, no. Nah, uh, uh. Now, if you've ever gone out to eat with Nathan, sit with us at Nathan and get to the restaurant, Nathan sits there and he's, he struggles with what to order. He wavers the whole time. We'll go to, um, y'all know where James, some of y'all know where James Daly is up there on, on near Guilford College. And all the time as a little kid, when we would go play Guilford College YMCA, uh, youth leagues and stuff, we'd go over there after the Saturday morning games, and he always got a double dog. And that's a quarter pound Oscar Mayer thing cooked on the grill with cheese on it and curly seasoned fries, and he always got it. And then one day we went in there, uh, not that long ago, a couple of years ago, and he wanted to do something different. But he's sitting there looking. And he ended up getting the double cheese dog right back to where he was. He'll go, and he'll go to Olive Garden. He wants to do something different. Now, he loves chicken parm. He'll get the menu out, and we'll, and we'll know he's going to end up at chicken parm. Okay? And he sits there and wavers between another different kind of meal and chicken parm and a different kind of meal and chicken parm. Everybody's ordered. The waitress is standing there. I'm, I'm ready for my food. Uh, uh, I really want uh, chicken parm. He just wavers trying to get, you know, to do something, to ordering. His ordering is wavering. Okay? And uh, at least thank God he doesn't, he does get something from the restaurant. Instead of <laughs> Hallelujah. Instead of, you know, uh, get, they, they're receiving nothing of the Lord. When we're acting, when we're walking with God, we're making a confession of faith. Remember, the power of life and death is in the tongue. Our words are governing us. We've got to get the word, right information from the right place. Now, you, when you begin to waver, you begin to waver between where you're getting, what, what information you're believing. Remember Isaiah 50, um, 52? Coming right down to the end of 52 and then moving into chapter 53. It says, Lord, who has believed our report? You get down 13, 14 of, of Verses 13, 14, 52, and then move into verse 1 of chapter 53, which is really, uh, if, you, if you were to really take and, and put the right chapter in the right place, it'd be about uh, between verse 12 and 13 of chapter 52. Okay, Men put the chapter dividers in there. Okay, Because, because really, chapters, uh, verses 13 and 14 are connected to what goes on in the first five, six, rest of 53. They're really connected to that. Okay, And so, Lord, who hath believed that report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? And so we have this, who hath believed the report of the Lord? You see? So if you're, you know, you're getting the right, you go get the right information, then you get challenged by the devil by symptoms, circumstances, and situations. And now what are you doing? If you waver and become unsteadfast, or you're not steadfast, you're unstable, let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. So, we have to become steadfast in speaking our faith so that we don't waver between the yes and the no. For God is not a waverer between yes and no. For all the promises of God are in Him. I mean, actually, actually the margin of the Weymouth. You see, even Weymouth has a margin on his statement. It's pretty cool. The margin of Weymouth says, and all the promises of God find the yes in him. Not just yes, the yes. It's yes. And our amen acknowledges its truth to the glory of God in us. And so what, what, is, what, what does amen mean? It is a word that literally means so be it. When you, so that's sometimes we, we, we do this because we, we you know we kind of pick up church culture and you know the devil's a devil is uh, beating your brains out amen preacher 
Well, we're the saying, so be it. That's probably not the right place for the amen. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Uh, you might, you know, that's right. That's what's hap- been happening, or you, you got it right, or whatever. But so be it means I, the, I, I agree with that. I'm coming into agreement with that. I, so be it. <clears throat> so and, and I, we do those things. We you know, kind of they, they don't mean so be it at that time. Does we're just acknowledging that what they said was a, 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 something we've experienced or true. But literally, the word amen means so be it. That's why when Paul writes it here, and um, it says, and our amen, our agreement, our so be it, acknowledges its truth to the glory of God where? In us. So by having a confession based on what the word of God says, so if we, go, if we get into 2 Corinthians 1, 18 through 20, in the Weymouth, you need to go look at Weymouth. You can find online Bibles that have Weymouth in there if you don't have the Weymouth translation. New Testament modern speech is the name of it, but it, they, they just refer to it as Weymouth. Okay, um, when we when we get this, okay, and we get that fact that our coming into a confession agreement and holding fast to that, holding fast. Not wavering, as James says. The double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. Okay? You know? Um, we, we It's unstable in all his ways. We cannot believe we're going to get anything from God when we are asking and, and then wavering. Okay. So we've got to be steadfast. We've got... We got to be bulldog with a bone, tenacious, stick to it. Not, I'm not letting go. I'm not relinquishing. I'm not giving up. I'm not quitting. I'm not going to back off. I refuse to quit. I refuse to heed. I refuse to give up. Okay? I'm not going to waver between God is and God ain't. Or I thought he was, but he didn't. Or why didn't he when I thought he would? Well, the problem was you can't think. You know. You got to know. The Bible says Abraham being fully persuaded. Well, see, when somebody's fully persuaded of something, then they act on it. You're fully persuaded that that something the Bible tells you is true, then you just can't be changed. Okay, when you're when the word of God per, per, fully persuades you of something. Okay, now one king, one guy told Paul one day, he says, "Thou almost persuadest me to be a Christian. Almost wasn't good enough." I said, "Almost wasn't good enough." Abraham was fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And his life was a demonstration and an action of that his entire life. Yeah, he messed up sometimes, but he got right back on it. Okay? So, here we go. So, again, if we're, if we're not going to be unstable, if we're not going to be double-minded, that means that we have to come back here to Weymouth in, in 1 Corinthians uh, 1, 18 and 20, or 2 Corinthians 18, 1, 18 and 20, back to the place where God doesn't waver, and we don't waver. Are they taking popcorn? Church is over. Okay, I'm sorry. It's a joke. Hallelujah. The instability in a life of not being steadfast will rob you of your answer. It'll rob you of your answer. You can't afford that. You want to win the battle, okay? Hesitation. See, instability creates hesitation. And when you're, like, if you're fighting a battle, you can't hesitate. I mean, you know, if you're if you're in a situation where there's you know there's weapons and guns being used and you got a weapon, if you hesitate, more than likely you're dead. You you got to defend yourself. You got to defend yourself. You can't hesitate, and you can't go turn your weapon in, and all the criminals will turn theirs in, as, as a great California senator, Senator Boxer said. 
Barbara Boxer, there's all the legal, all the legal guns were turned in, all the criminals were turned in because that's just human nature. No. <laughs> and it just baffles me the depths of ignorance in the unrenewed mind. Okay? I just, I just stand in absolute abject amazement. <laughs> really? Now that means you're just going to show up at your house to take everything you got because I know you ain't got no gun. They didn't get theirs legally anyway. You think they're going to give it up? They're going to give up the... <laughs> anyway. All right. Praise God. Well, it looks like my... Uh, I guess Jesse's putting this out there. Um, First Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 1, 18 and 20 through the Weymouth. As certainly as God is... Our language to you is now not is not now yea and now no. For all the promises of God, whatever their number, have their confirmation in him. And that's where the, the margin of what he says, the yes in him. Okay? And for this reason, through our, him also our, amen, acknowledges their truth and promotes the glory of God through our faith. Okay? That's, that's verbatim. Okay? All right. That word, their confirmation, the margin of the Weymouth says the yes. It actually says literally the yes. All right? So, Paul says our language is not yes and no. Not yes one minute, no the next. It's not, it doesn't waver. Okay? God doesn't waver. God's not a waverer. Christians shouldn't be waverers. Amen? All right, praise the Lord. So, let's look at what we're going to close up with here, right here. Because we're going to go to Mark chapter 5 and we're gonna look at a Bible example okay there's a five mark chapter 5 we'll be reading uh, 25 through 34 and you know this story this is the woman with the issue of blood extremely anemic and so forth. All right. A certain woman, now, some people want to make everything Jesus said a parable. He said a certain woman, which is, the Bible says a certain woman, which had suffered, had an issue of blood 12 years, suffered many things and many physicians, and all that she had was nothing better, but rather grew worse. When she heard of Jesus, now let's stop. What, 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 what's going on? She suffered... <laughs> I'm going to use a different color. That way I can write in some other places and it won't run together. All right? So we're looking at Mark 5 here. We're talking about this. Okay? What's the first thing that happened? Heard Jesus. Okay? What does that relate to? <laughs> she got her information from the right place. Okay? came in the press behind him and touched his garment, for she said, all right, so two, she said. And act, it really kind of got to kind of put those together because, you know, what is that? That relates to her words. So she's saying because she got some information from the right place. What we do here is we establish the fact that confession governs but, but in order to, for it to begin to govern, you got to get the word. Really, you do this first. You get the information from the right place first, and then it, you use it to govern. All right? Okay. Um, if I may touch his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood dried up, and she was felt in her body she was healed of that plague. Now, the Greek says, she said and kept saying, What was she doing? She was holding fast. Okay? Now, in the beginning, she had a choice. Okay? She had a choice at the very beginning. But she heard of Jesus. So she got some right information. It began to govern what she said, and she held fast. For she said and kept on saying. Okay? Amplified Bible says, she, for she kept saying, if I, touch, if I only touch his garments, 
I shall be restored to health. And again, that is Amplified Classic, the old, you know, um, a if you look up the AMP now, you get, you get a messed up translation. The AMP Classic is one we use, and I don't like the other one. So um, I, they, they, they compromised it too much. The whole purpose of it before was to bring clarity. Then they went and changed some stuff around, and, and it doesn't carry the same import as far as I'm concerned. People complain because it was too long and too wordy, but that, some people even call it the woman's translation. That's, that's, a, that's a church joke, okay? All right, just don't, get, don't, don't send me anything. I, it's a joke. Okay? And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body she was healed of the plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And the spiritual, deep, thoughtful disciples looked at Jesus and said, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou who touched me. Now let me put this into modern English, okay? The disciples lifted their eyebrows, looked at one another, and thought, he didn't get enough sleep last night. Master, you see the multitude thronging you, and you asking who touched you? Everybody's touching you! Now that's what they're saying here. Okay? King Jimmy dresses it up. Makes it real reverent. And thou sayest, who touched me? <laughs> oh, the King Jimmy sounds so poetic. But the real import here is everybody's touching you. Have you gone cray-cray? Now, that's really what they're saying here. Okay? <laughs> I just love Jesus. <laughs> uh, and he looked round about. It's like, Foghorn, leghorn, I say, I say, I say, don't you bother me, boy, you bother me. <laughs> hey, dog, you bother me, boy. Uh, <laughs> that old dog. Yeah. Okay. He's like, he looks, he doesn't even acknowledge they were breathing. Okay. And so he looks round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. What did she tell him? She said, well, I've been, you know, obviously she told him everything because we found out she'd been a woman with an issue of blood 12 years, things and many physicians, everything that she had. But she heard Jesus. She heard of Jesus. Now, somewhere she heard, and there's, there's other scriptures talking about that people touched his clothes and got touched his, his garment and got healed. She had to have heard that. that, that rumors were going around that people were just touching his clothes and getting healed. And she heard that. She got some, the right information. And then she began to allow her word. She said and kept on saying, said, acted, and kept, kept on saying, and then acted upon. Her words began to govern life and death in her life. And she held fast it. Now, how do you know she held fast? Well, because she had an issue of blood, she was considered unclean. Under Jewish law, for her to come in contact with other people, was a stoning offense. For her to go out in public, now what she was supposed to do, <clears throat> when she was like people coming, she was to stop and cry out, unclean, unclean, so they could avoid her. She was responsible to do that. An obligation. <clears throat> or she could be put to death for not doing that. Okay? But the Bible says she came in the press, and she wasn't going unclean, unclean, unclean. She said and kept on saying, if I can touch him, I'll be whole. If I can touch him, I'll be whole. If I can touch him, what's she doing? She's holding fast. She's not being unstable. She's not wavering. She has got her words working in her behalf. She is saying, I, she wasn't even acknowledging she was unclean. She wasn't even thinking about that. All she was doing was acting on what she was letting her words govern her because she heard of Jesus. She began to speak and kept saying she was holding fast and she would not waver by stopping in the middle of all that going, oh no. She got there and here's a throng, crowd thronging her, him. And she could have wavered and went, oh, I tried. She could have been Eeyore. No matter. 
Probably wouldn't have got anything anyway. Hello? Well. Okay. And moving on from there. Hallelujah. But she, she got there, and here's this whole crowd around him. She can't get in there. And we, we, we suppose he probably got down and crawled in. It was the only way to really get in there because everybody's just pressed up there, and the only space to get was by, through people's legs. They're, thr they're pressing against him. Now, I remember a number of years ago, um, oh, my goodness, Janie was 16, and we had just started dating that earlier that year i was 18 she was 16 okay well by the time we went to florida that year we were 17 and 19 okay and um her my parents got her to come on the florida christmas trip with us and uh we went to disney world and then i pulled our camper down stayed in stayed in the camper and uh went to disney world and when in, and back then, you didn't have all the, you know, the African and all the, uh, all the extra stuff. It was just the Magic Kingdom. And I'm not sure if Epcot was open by then, because this is 77, okay? I can't remember when Epcot opened. But, you know, it was Magic Kingdom first and then Epcot, and then they started doing all the other stuff. And um, we walked in the front gate. If you've ever been to Disney, they got that main street when you come in, in the Magic Kingdom area. Of course, now you can go to other parks, you know, but... That back then, everybody came in the Magic Kingdom. And we're walking in with the gates. We get there early, and the gates are open. We're all coming in. And I experienced a throng. Now, Janie and I got separate. We lost holding hands. And our family was kind of going in. But, and, and the crowd just took us. So I finally got over to, to one of the little shop areas where they got the porches, and people were, you know, you kind of look out like a walkways under the porches. And I'm jumping up. And I really had to jump high because Janie's, you know, short. No, she's over there, and I'm over here. I'm, yeah, Carrie. All right. Trying to find her because the throng and the push of the crowd just was its own entity. And you just couldn't walk over. Oh, there she is, and walk. I mean, you had to navigate, you know, with this whole moving entity to try to get back together. Well, Jesus is going down the street, and here we go. All these people, the curiosity seekers. Now, we know that all the people touching him weren't in faith because they were just curiosity seekers. But when somebody touched him differently, he stopped. All of a sudden, in the middle of all that, she touched his clothes because she said and kept on saying, I can touch him, I'll be whole. If I can touch him, I'll be whole. If I can touch him, I'll be whole. If I can touch him. And the, but in the moment she touched him, she had to come and not wait when she saw that crowd. He's over there in the middle. She's unclean. It is a stonable offense for her to come in contact with anybody in that crowd. Oh, my. But I'll tell you, when you get it by faith, when you have, your faith is out there and you're not wavering, nothing can stop you from your answer. Glory to God. I said glory to God. And so she said and kept on saving. She got there and saw that crowd. She got through that crowd, probably on her hands and knees, crawling in. And they're so caught up, they didn't even recognize that the woman's down there. Because I can guarantee you, if somebody saw her there unclean, they'd have been ready to stone somebody. Because they were, they were professional stoners. All right? We know that because they caught the woman in adultery in the very act of her to Jesus. I always want to ask the question, where was the man? Because they caught him in the act. Didn't say, didn't say he had left and, you know, she was kind of just sitting around, you know, um, after, the, after the event, caught her in the very act. They want to stone her. These people like to stone folk. Because, I mean, you know, blow out your candle, mine looks brighter. Hello? But she gets in there and touches it. And the moment she touches him, what happens? Because she held fast. The answer was yes. Not yes and no. It was yes. Her action was her amen. Okay? Her action was her amen. 
And by acting on it, she received and immediately knowing that she was healed of that plague. Jesus stops and goes, who touched me? Now, see, the disciples are thinking, who touched me physically? Jesus is going, somebody just got here in faith. And when they made contact with me in faith, virtue went out of me. Power went out of me. A healing anointing flowed out. And it wasn't the touch of curiosity. It wasn't the touch of hope so, maybe so, wish it could be so. It was a touch of faith that was being governed by words that she said, kept on saying, and acted on, and would not waver in the midst of a challenge to what she was believing. But she said, virtue went out of him. She was healed of that plague. And Jesus stopped, finally got her up there, and goes, woman, I am the son of God. And I have come to prove to all these people that I was sent by the Father, Therefore, you've been healed out of my mercy. That's not what he said. Now, church teachings will tell us that. But the Bible doesn't teach us that. What does the Bible say? Woman, thy faith hath made thee whole. Well, we know the Bible said that virtue went out of him. Right? So we, we make on the fact that healing virtue, healing power went out of Jesus. He was going around healing people to prove he was the son of God. Jesus didn't say it was because of that. He said, you're fa You see, if virtue was just going out of him automatically, everybody would have been getting healed. But in the midst of all this, we only have one record, and we know people are touching him. The th multitude's thronging him. But we've got a record. Now, the Bible, God, by the anointing of the Holy Ghost on men to record things, did not do anything by mistake, without a purpose. God took the time to move on Mark by the Holy Ghost, to breathe on him, to have him write, to record this in this way. So that we would know that there were people touching Jesus and they weren't getting anything. We would know that people were pressing up against him and there wasn't people slain in the spirit and falling all over the place and everybody was getting healed and he walked out of the city and everybody's in the street and rise up and they're all well. Solomon's porch. Jesus walks over to one guy and says, will you be made whole? I don't have anybody to put me in the water. And that's, that's not the question. You know? Walks off and leaves the rest of them there. It's a manifestation of the Holy Ghost. Because of the charismatic healing revival, we put so much emphasis on the gifts of the Spirit. And we thank God for the gifts of the Spirit. We do. We thank God for special anointings. But they're manifest as He will. And when He's not manifesting those things, people are not left helpless. That's the wonderful thing. As a matter of fact, the main way people should be receiving from God is by faith particularly believers. We know that God works through the manifestations of the gifts of the Spirit and does that a lot. He works with us, confirming the Word with signs following. But in this particular case, God wanted to highlight the lifestyle of the believer. For the just shall walk by faith and not by sight. The just shall live by his faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. That's, that's recorded four times in the Bible. Three of them in the New Testament and the Old Testament has, and the, for the just shall live by his faith. Okay? And we have a version of that three times in the New Testament. The just shall live by faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. Okay? And so the Bible's teaching us that we are to live a life of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. And then Jesus tells us in Mark 11, 22, 23, and 24, he says, have the faith of God. Then remember, he said that in response to Peter. And on the morrow as they passed by, uh, Peter calling to remember, said, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursed is withered away. And if you go back up to around verse 10 of, that, of Mark chapter 5, um, Mark 11, 
It said, around verse 5, it says, you know, uh, that, they were, that they were coming out, out to the city, and Jesus was hungry and saw a fig tree far off having leaves on it. He came happily if he might find any figs on it for the time of the fig, uh, figs was not yet. In other words, he, didn't, he, was, he was not positive there'd be figs on it, but it had leaves, and it was supposed to have figs, and it had leaves. But it wasn't time for the figs. So it had bloomed out of season. It had lied. So when Jesus got there, no figs, he said, no man eat fruit of the hereafter forever. And the disciples heard it. God didn't put that in there by mistake. How many of you ever saw the movie Jesus of Nazareth, the, the NBC television special they put on there? They put on by every year for Easter for years. You know, with Jeffrey, somebody as, the, as Jesus, you know, the blue-eyed Jesus. Probably didn't have blue eyes, guys. He was a Jew. Okay? But you know, Hollywood, you know, you got a blue-eyed Jesus. All right. And, um, you know, and, the, and every time Jesus works a miracle in that movie, it's a shadow. They got the, they got the person, and a, they got a, sh a hand, sh the shadow of a hand coming toward the person, and they got some choir in the background going, oh, almost spooky. So they're making the miracles, he's really spooky. I mean, it's not Casper the ghost in manifestation. All right? Shush. No. You know, we can get some kind of crazy. But God didn't put record things by mistake. Well, which one was on before? I, I was, I was going to go back to the one with the issue above. There's another one I was on. Fix, oh, yeah. So he said to the fig tree, I mean, he was here after forevermore, and the disciples heard it. Okay? Jesus didn't stand over there and look at the fig tree and go, okay, and walk off, and it died. He spoke to it. And the reason God put that in the Bible was he knows that words govern. And the disciples heard it. It wasn't silent prayer. Doesn't exist. That's thinking. There's no such thing as silent meditation because the actual word in the Hebrew to meditate means to mutter. You know? And as a good old Pentecostal boy growing up in church and we're taking prayer requests and after everybody's given their spoken request, how many of y'all got an unspoken request? When you stop and think about it, how stupid is it to think you can have an unspoken request? Now, I'm not talking about right, you know, versus writing it down. I'm talking about an unspoken request. We're going to agree with you. How can I agree with you? How can I agree with you about something I don't know what I'm agreeing about? You want me to pray about something, then not tell me what it is. How can I pray about it? Well, the Lord knows. Well, unless he tells me, I can't pray about it. He'll have to reveal it to me so I can pray about it and be in faith about it. Hello? And so Jesus spoke to the fig tree. The disciples heard they went into town, ran money changers out, comes back out, and it says, on the morrow when they pass back by, Peter called him, remember, it says, behold, master, the fig tree, you curse is withered away. And Jesus goes, yeah, man, I am. God in the flesh, stuff listens to me. That's not what he said. He took the opportunity for a faith lesson. And he said, what did he say? Have faith in God. Now, the Greek can also be translated to say have the faith of God or the God kind of faith. Okay? Have the faith of God. Have the God kind of faith. For verily, now verily is a strong oath. It translates the Greek word in the, in the strongest English word at the time was verily. You know, I'm, I swear I make a solemn oath to you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that the things which he saith shall come to pass, he'll have whatsoever ever he saith so we find out from here that whosoever shall have whatsoever if what if what they say they believe in their heart this comes back to 
You've got to get the right stuff in your heart. And that's what this woman with the issue of blood did. She heard of Jesus. She began to say it and kept on saying it to the point she got up and acted on it. She got up and acted on it. And she didn't waver when she ran into the crowd. I mean, she just bulldogged her way right on through that crowd and got to him and touched his clothes and got her answer. Amen? So Jesus said, whosoever shall, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt, where? In his heart, but shall believe that the things which he saith shall come to pass, he'll have whatsoever he saith. For, for very last saying to you that uh, what things ever ye desire, or he actually just goes on and says that. Therefore, what things ever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. So there's a divine, there's a divine connection between speaking and receiving. But speaking what we believe. And that's what it's called confession. The power of life and death, Proverbs 18, 21, is in the tongue. What you believe and what you say produces. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. What you love, what you embrace, what you are convinced of, that you speak, you'll eat the fruit thereof. Hello. You're going to eat that fruit because you believe it. And so the woman with the issue of blood did all these things. And she was not... This, this is just so big to me. She didn't waver when she got there. We can be so confident and all of a sudden run into an office and go, oh, my God, I thought I had the answer. Oh, Jesus, why did you bring me this far just to let me down? And waver at the miracle. Waver at the point of receiving. Waver at the point of manifestation, uh, sh should be better stated. Because you received it when you began to speak it and you believed you had it. But waver, right? Something sticks his ugly head up and you go wavering. Mm-hmm. And you just, oh my. And you get the EOR face on and you walk off. Hello? You gotta be <coughs> when it comes to faith, you gotta be Tigger. <coughs> Pouncy, pouncy, pouncy. Tigger's just all over it. I think blue is part tigger. Oh, my goodness. And so the woman, see, and Jesus said, Woman, thy faith made thee whole, go peace. Amen. Behold of thy plague. She got it. Because she got this. Amen. So we're going to recap. Confession, Proverbs 18, 21, the power of life and death is in the tongue. We know, we know this, our words govern life and death. Therefore, we have to get the information from the right place. Let me tell you something, folks. You go to the doctor and say you don't have a chance, and you, you accept that, you'll begin to say it, and the power of life and death is in your tongue. You better go get the right information you need to live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. Amen? You, once you begin speaking it, you've got to hold fast. You've got to keep saying, keep believing, keep declaring what you believe. Why? Because blessing and evil is your choice. And the, the blessing or evil are released through the power of our words. So where are you getting your information from? Amen? Amen? And then you, got, you just can't waver. you got to be steadfast. And what happens when you don't waver and you're steadfast and you do all this? Now, we're not trying to give you steps. Step one is this. Step two is that. Step three is this. These are road mark. These are markers to let you know where you are. And if you're not saying the right stuff, don't think you're going to get the right stuff. Amen. You can't. You can't believe you're going to get the right stuff. Okay. Let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. Verse 6 of chapter James 1. For he that wavereth is like the wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. It's not that God wants to hold out on you or God was keeping it from you. He wavered. 
You can't waver. You've got to stay steadfast. You've got to be sick to a bulldog. You just can't quit. Amen? Praise the Lord. Well, I hope you got something out of this teaching on confession. We'll, uh, put, we'll, we'll begin something next week. Actually, may, maybe a couple of weeks because of, of shorter ones, uh, shorter teaching, because I really do. As soon as we get all the uh, stuff in for the authority of the believer teaching, we're moving into that. Okay? I'm, I'm really excited about that. So once we get all the materials in, we get everything ready, and we get ready to distribute it and get it to you. And we'll try to do it on a Sunday so that you can be ready for that first Wednesday night. Okay? We don't want to wait till Wednesday night to get it to you because then we've got to wait for you to go home and read it and study it and get ready for the lesson. So if we can get it to you on the Sunday, then we can, uh, we can, when we get here on Wednesday, we're ready to roll. And uh, we'll probably, on that, those Wednesday nights, just set tables up in here so you can sit down and write and have books and stuff. Uh, we want to we make it a learning, it's a learning thing. It's not a Holy Ghost service in the sense of, you know, people falling out and we're laying hands on the sick and casting out devils and running and shouting. I love those services too. But this is Bible study. And we're going to be doing a Bible study on a certain teaching, okay? The, the believer's authority. I'm uh, looking forward to that. So we hope you, you know, now, those of you that are watching tonight, we're going to be beginning teaching in the next, uh, we're still waiting, we've got some back-ordered materials. Uh, Brother Hagen's uh, Believer's Authority Legacy Edition, the book. Uh, the Believer's Authority Study Guide. Um, the two tape series, um, The Believer's Authority and Reigning in Life as a King. Uh, or CDs or MP3s, however you can get them now. And you, can get them, you can't get them on tape. If you get them on tape, then somebody's got some old ones somewhere. You, you can't buy the tapes anymore. Uh, I'm sure they have some in the warehouse somewhere, but you, you, you can't get the tapes, all right? And if you're still using cassette, Lord help you. We are way down the road from there. I mean, we're, we're, CDs are almost obsolete, okay? We're, we're using MP3s, and we're using thumb drives, and we're using, um, you know, drop. we're just tapping our phones with one another, and it's transferring stuff. I mean, you know, it's just, we're the, the digital age, okay? Um, but anyway, uh, that's the materials you, you that's the materials you will need so the tape series or cd series teaching series how about that by brother hagan uh, kenneth he e hagan uh, dad hagan on the believer's authority reigning in life as a king his book the um believer's authority legacy edition now there's two versions of the, the, the believer's authority and then the legacy edition there's more material in the legacy edition and that goes along with the study guide the believer's authority study guide that's, that's another book. So those two books, two, two um, teaching series, and you'll need that to be able to follow along with us and go with us on this teaching. We would, you, know, you can order it from rhema.org, or you can go to um, just one of the Bible book distributors, Whitaker House or, or somebody like that. Uh, they carry those materials. So, um, you know, Amazon has some of it. I don't know if they have all of it, but, you know, however, whatever place you look to find it, rhema.org, amazon.com. Uh, Whitaker House, I believe it was Whitaker House, um, publishers, they, they sell these things, and so you can, you can order them if you're online and want to get them, okay? Uh, praise the Lord, so you can go along with us. And uh, we'd love to have you join us for the Bible study. Praise the Lord. All right, so until we meet again, God bless you. Remember this, this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith, and your faith is released by what you say in Jesus' name. Join us Sunday morning at 1030, 11 o'clock for our Sunday morning service. Until then, God bless you. Hallelujah. We'll see you then.